Strussen. I'm a neurologist and a professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Today, I want to talk to you about brain imaging technologies that now allow us to put a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease at very early stages. We do not know exactly why people get Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, but we do know a great deal about risk factors and about the biochemical and the structural changes that take part in the brain of patients with those disorders. Um, let's talk about Parkinson's disease first. Uh, Parkinson's disease is a fairly common disorder. It affects approximately 1% of all people uh, older than 50 years. And um, when the neurologists see patients with advanced stages of Parkinson's disease, it rarely presents a diagnostic problem. But for uh, patients that come in to see the neurologist with very early stages of the disease, it may be harder to put a correct diagnosis. And this is because um, we have a range of different neurological disorders that all involve disturbances with movement. And uh, although they may seem to look uh, the same way, they are actually quite distinct uh, from each other. Now, uh, the symptoms that the neurologist use to determine whether this is a patient with Parkinson's disease in early stages would consist of specific things, including slowment of movement, uh, rigidity of uh, the limbs, and tremor uh, of particularly the hands. Uh, when uh, these three symptoms are present, uh, the neurologist can pose a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease with a certainty of approximately uh, 67%. So obviously, uh, there will be some patients that are not diagnosed correctly, and therefore they cannot receive uh, the right treatment. Now, um, one of, the, the, one of the distinct disturb disturbances that take place in Parkinson's disease is within the so-called dopamine system. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, that is, it's a chemical substance that one nerve cell in the brain uses to communicate with another brain cell. And what is wrong with Parkinson's patients' brains is that the dopamine-producing uh, cells in the brainstem are degenerating. Uh, there are today ways that we can use to image uh, with brain scanners uh, the different parts of the dopamine system. Uh, and one part of the dopamine system that is particularly affected in Parkinson's disease is the so-called dopamine transporter. What the dopamine transporter does is it, it serves to bring back released dopamine into the nerve cell that um, generated uh, the signal from uh, the beginning. Now, um, when uh, we look at uh, the different parts of the dopamine system, we can here see uh, at uh, uh, the left, we see a healthy person and we see a, an image of one from a patient with Parkinson's disease. So imagine that the scanner has taken a cross-sectional view horizontally through the brain at the level of what we term the striatum in the middle. You can see how the healthy person has a high amount of dopamine transporters reflected in the bright colors, whereas the patient with Parkinson's disease has virtually no dopamine transporter left. This can be used diagnostically to determine if the patient has a brain disorder that involves affection of the dopamine system. At the right panel, you can see a plot where we have quantified the dopamine transporter. So the black dots represent uh, a measure of the dopamine transporter for a healthy person at a given age. And here you can also see that the dopamine transporters go down uh, as we age. And in this way, we can compare the images acquired in patients with movement disorders to healthy people based on their age. And in the image, you also see that the red dots are patients that have a dysfunction of their dopamine system, uh, and the black dots would be the natural age um, evolvement of the dopamine transporters in the brain. The next slide 
uh, you see uh, examples of different disorders that can mimic Parkinson's disease, but in fact are different. And by using uh, this imaging technology, by visualizing uh, the dopamine transporters, you can see that disorders where a dysfunction of the dopamine system is present, that is, you have a degeneration of the dopamine transmitter system, uh, the dopamine transporters in the brain will be reduced. Whereas in other disorders, including Alzheimer's disease uh, or essential tremor, which is a familiar form of tremor, uh, the dopamine system uh, is still intact. Now, um, by using these methods, we can then diagnose the Parkinson patients very early on. I would now like to move on to speak about uh, how to diagnose Alzheimer's disease in early stages. Just as with Parkinson's disease, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can be really difficult in the initial stages. And we also know that both disorders start very early on. So a particular hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of a certain protein called amyloid. It is still debatable to what extent amyloid causes Alzheimer's disease or whether it is just associated with the disease. But we do know that patients with Alzheimer's disease have an abnormal accumulation of this protein Recent imaging technologies have now allowed us for us to image uh, the, the abnormal protein accumulation of the amyloid. This is done by radio labeling traces with uh, specific affinity, that is, they bind specifically to the amyloid. And in this way, you can image with some scanning technologies how this abnormal accumulation takes place. So in this image, you can see in the top panel a healthy control with little binding and little accumulation of uh, the amyloid protein. In the lower panel, you see a patient with uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and you can clearly see how the abnormal protein accumulation uh, takes place uh, in this brain. Um, if you compare that to uh, the atrophy, the shrinkage that also takes place, uh, then uh, it's been shown that although brain shrinkage is prominent, uh, it is much less prominent than uh, the uh, amyloid accumulation. And that um, makes it possible for you to put a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease at a very early stage compared to uh, normal uh, MRI scans, where you just look at the structural differences. Um, there are treatments available both for Alzheimer's disease and for Parkinson's disease. However, none of those treatments are curative. And um, if you look at, for instance, uh, the effect of treatment of Alzheimer's disease, you can see at this graph that um, the uh, treatment can ameliorate the symptoms. So here you have a graph showing uh, the progression of the disease um, as time goes by. And intervention with treatment of, with drugs can stabilize the symptoms for approximately one to two years. But after that time period, the treatment will become uh, less effective and uh, you will have a continued progression uh, of the symptoms. So both uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's disease are progressive disorders uh, that cannot be stopped at uh, this time. Now, uh, there are good reasons to believe that if one could initiate treatment very early on, one would actually be able to prevent uh, the clinical appearance of symptoms. Uh, so uh, with the imaging tools I just described to you, we can today predict the diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease even before the symptoms manifest clinically. Now obviously this has some ethical and practical implications. If you can pose the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease very early on, even before the clinical symptoms appear, 
uh, then uh, you would need also to offer those people uh, a sufficient treatment, which does not exist today. On the other hand, if we want to develop in the future treatments that intervene very early on, then we would need to have the diagnostic tools to uh, put a diagnosis very early on. And um, this, by having access to these imaging methods I just described, this means that we can more precisely and earlier diagnose the disorders. And this will also uh, be a very important step to identify people who could benefit from treatments that can prevent further progression and clinical presentation in the future.